Hello and welcome to the Biological Resources Information Program for the Campus Parkway Segment 3 project. This training is provided by Alluvian Biological Consulting. Now this training has four broad objectives. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be familiar with all four of these points. First, we're going to cover the definition and implications of take. Then we'll move on to your responsibilities if you encounter a regulated species. We'll have a brief introduction to the protected species associated with this project, and then we'll go over some general mitigation measures that need to be followed in order to prevent any incidents of take. We'd like to emphasize that this training is meant to supplement, not replace, the training information handouts that you should have received before watching this video. If you have not received a training pamphlet or booklet, please request one from your supervisor or on-site alluvian biologist. Let's start by discussing take. Take is a broadly defined term, and under the Federal Endangered Species Act, take means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, capture, collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. Now, penalties for take will vary from species to species. However, any individual found to be committing unsanctioned take may be dealt hefty fines, and in some cases, up to a year in jail time. These penalties are assessed for each instance of unsanctioned take. So what should you do if you encounter a regulated species on the project? The very first thing you should do is ensure that you do not touch or approach the animal. You should then immediately suspend work within the area the animal was found, especially if this work would result in take. Your next step is to notify your supervisor or the on-site biologist. If a biologist is not on-site, please contact Gennaro Lockhart at the number listed on this slide and in your training materials. Unless otherwise noted in your materials, a 100-foot no-work buffer will need to be established around the species of concern until it either moves off the project site of its own volition or until permission is received from regulatory agencies to reduce or eliminate the no-work buffer. The next few slides will give you a brief overview of all of the listed and regulated species that occur on this project site. San Joaquin Kit Fox is a small fox measuring about 32 inches in length. It's one of eight recognized subspecies of Kit Fox, and it's the smallest known canon. Individuals usually exhibit gray to buff fur along their backs, sides, and tails, as well as white fur along their bellies. Kit foxes can be distinguished from other fox species by their relatively diminutive size and their overlarge ears. This subspecies can be found throughout the arid regions of Southern California, and it prefers to inhabit annual grasslands with scattered shrubs and scrub utilizing complex burrow systems for shelter. Kit foxes excavate burrows in loose soil and may construct up to 36 entrances for a single den. A single kit fox may utilize between 3 and 26 such dens. San Joaquin kit foxes reach breeding age at approximately 2 years, and pups are born in February through May. Females nurse broods of 1 to 7 pups until they have weaned in approximately 4 to 5 months. This project requires several protective measures for San Joaquin kit fox. These measures can also be found in your training booklets. First, if you're driving a vehicle on the project, you'll need to keep your speed below 20 miles per hour on all unpaved roads. Additionally, no pets are allowed on the project site. This includes cats and dogs. And finally, Work is only permitted after sunset if a biologist is present on site and if lighting on the project is used only for vehicle and pedestrian safety. Pallid bat is a small bat, about 6 to 8 centimeters in length, with yellowish cream colored fur on its back and white fur on its belly. Perhaps the most distinctive feature of this bat is its large ears, which may measure half the total length of its body. Pallid bats are found throughout most of the low-lying regions in California, and they may use grasslands, shrublands, and forests while roosting in rocky crevices during the day. This species is highly sensitive to disturbance at its roost, but some individuals may be found seeking refuge in man-made structures and buildings. 
Peculiar to most bats, pallid bats feed almost exclusively on the ground as opposed to while in flight. They eat a variety of ground insects as well as lizards and small rodents. Breeding takes place in October to February, however females will delay fertilization. This delay, combined with a 50 to 70 day gestation period, results in pups born in April through July. Females give birth to one to three offspring, and young bats are able to fly on their own after seven weeks. Western Mastiff Bat is the largest bat species found in California, with a length of about 15 to 18 centimeters and dark to brownish gray fur. Two distinguishing characteristics of this species are its long, narrow wings and its large, rounded ears that are joined at the midline across the forehead and project forward. The Western Mastiff Bat ranges from San Francisco across to the Sierra Nevada mountains and south, preferring open, arid to semi-arid habitats such as various woodlands, scrublands, grasslands, and even some urban environments. This species prefers roosting in vertical rock faces high above the ground. And Mastiff bats eat a variety of insects while in flight and will forage for exceptionally long periods of time compared to other bats, up to six to seven hours. Breeding takes place around March, with females giving birth to a single pup sometime between April and September. Yuma myotis bat is a small bat species, about four to five centimeters in length, with pale brown fur. It bears straight and slim ears, a broad snout, and a rounded head. This species is widespread throughout California, inhabiting woodland areas near water bodies. Yuma myotis prefer to feed on insects on the wing over naturally occurring and man-made water bodies. The species roosts on rocky crevices within natural and artificial structures, with some maternity roosts supporting thousands of bats. Night roosts for the species are often separate from day roosts and found in more open habitat. The species mates in the fall, with females giving birth to a single pup from late May to mid-June. Bat species found on this project will require special protective measures. To start, tree removal for this project should take place as close to the month of October as possible to avoid disturbing maternity roosts. In the event that bats are discovered roosting in trees, a biologist may need to be present during tree removal. And if a maternity roost is found, a protective buffer of 100 feet will be required until all bats can be properly evicted. Western burrowing owl is a small, brown, mottled owl that stands about seven to nine inches in height. True to its name, the burrowing owl nests in a hole in the ground. Although it's quite willing to dig its own burrow, it often uses one that's already provided by prairie dogs, skunks, ground squirrels, or other wildlife. Burrowing owls require habitat with open, well-drained terrain, short, sparse vegetation, and underground burrows. During the breeding season, they may also need enough permanent cover and taller vegetation within their foraging range to provide them with sufficient prey. Because of this, burrowing owls can occupy a wide range of habitats, including grasslands, agricultural areas, urban vacant lots, as well as the margins of airports. Breeding in California can start as early as January and continue through September. The peak of breeding is in April. Burrowing owls can lay anywhere between 1 to 11 eggs. The, uh, the young hatch in about 30 days and fledge after 45 days. They will remain at the burrow for some time, foraging at night with the adults, until they're ready to fledge on their own. Burrowing owls will also require their own protective measures on this project. Depending on the time of year, active burrows may require a no-work buffer of anywhere between 165 to 655 feet. Owls may only be evicted from burrows by the qualified biologist using passive relocation techniques. And if evictions are necessary, artificial burrows may be constructed outside of the project area. Swainson's hawk is a medium to large sized hawk with adults getting up to 21 inches in length with 52 inch wingspans. Their plumage is variable and there are usually two color morphs. The first morph is a light phase, which have dark heads, breast bands, and light bellies, while the dark phase birds are going to be sooty black. Both color phases have bicolored underwings, dark gray flight feathers, 
lighter wing linings, a broad tail, and long, relatively narrow pointed wings. In March and April, they arrive on breeding grounds in the Solano and Central Valley counties, as well as the interior valleys of the coastal ranges. Breeding habitat includes woodlands, savanna, grasslands, and scattered trees. Swainson's hawk require large tracts of grassland and open land for which to forage. During migration and foraging, they use open lowlands, and these hawks typically occur at elevations from sea level to 1,500 feet. Mountain plover is a medium-sized shorebird measuring 8 to 9 inches in length. Typical of most plovers, this species bears a short beak and neck with a rounded head. Plumage for the top of the wings and back is typically light brown or tan, with the face, underbelly, and underwing all being white. During the breeding season, adults will develop a black forehead patch along with a line of black feathers running from their eye to their beak on each side of their head. Mountain plover may be found throughout California's Central Valley in areas of open grasslands and cleared grazed agricultural fields. This species avoids habitat with tall and dense vegetation. Mountain plovers do not breed in California, instead spending the winter months in the state before migrating to Montana or North Dakota to breed. Females nest on the ground, laying a clutch of one to four eggs between late April and June. Chicks are able to leave the nest with their mother soon after hatching. Tricolored blackbird is a medium-sized passerine bird with a conical beak, usually anywhere between seven to nine inches long. Male breeding plumage is almost entirely black, but they do carry a distinctive red shoulder patch bordered with white fringe. This species is found throughout the Central Valley and a few coastal environments within and south of Sonoma County. Tricolored blackbirds can be found nesting in freshwater wetland vegetation as well as agricultural fields. Their diet consists primarily of insects and seeds. This species forms the largest nesting colonies of any passerine bird, with a 10-acre area containing between 50 to 20,000 nests. Nests are built in dense vegetation with plenty of cover, and breeding takes place from May to July. Females rear up to two broods of four chicks per nesting season, and incubation lasts up to two weeks, with another two weeks required for nestlings to fledge. White-tailed kite is a medium-sized raptor, 13 to 15 inches in length, with a long white tail, a gray back, and white facial feathers. Adults have red eyes, while juveniles have yellow eyes, and all individuals have a distinctive black spot beneath each wing wrist, in addition to a sharply hooked beak. White-tailed kites may inhabit a wide range of habitats, including savanna, marshes, cultivated lands, desert, and woodlands. The species feeds almost exclusively on small mammals, and in California, white-tailed kites are commonly associated with agricultural lands. They frequently nest on the tops of trees and stands adjacent to open foraging area. Mating takes place from February to October, and clutch size typically ranges from 4 to 5 eggs. With an incubation period of 28 to 32 days, chicks usually fledge after about 38 days. Loggerhead Shrike is a medium-sized passerine bird with a hooked beak and a relatively large head compared to its body size. Adults are gray with black masks and white throats. This species is found throughout the foothills and lowlands of California, preferring open country with short vegetation and well-spaced shrubs or low trees. Loggerhead Shrikes frequently impale large prey items on thorns or barbed wire and this behavior creates stores of food in larders for consumption during the winter season. Their diet consists of grasshoppers, beetles, and rodents. However, this species is known to prey on a wide range of animals and can kill and carry prey as massive as itself. Shrikes build nests in dense, thorny vegetation, and females may have up to two broods of five to six eggs per year. Incubation lasts 15 to 17 days with a 16 to 20 day nestling period. Horned lark is a small songbird measuring six to eight inches in length. Their plumage is light brown on the back with a lighter colored underbelly. 
Adults have black eye masks, chest bands, and head stripes, while the rest of the face is either yellow or white. Males differentiate themselves from females with more pronounced facial plumage and retractable horn-like feather projections on either side of their head that may be raised or lowered during the breeding season. Horn larks can be found in many of the lowlands of California and inhabit areas with low grasses and bare ground. This species is a ground forager, feeding on a combination of seeds and insects. Horned larks breed from March through July, building a grass-lined nest cup in a natural depression on the ground. Females incubate two to five eggs for a period of 10 to 14 days. Nestlings fledge in nine to 12 days and are capable of flight within three to five days. White-faced ibis is a medium-sized shorebird measuring up to 22 inches in length. Typical of most ibis species, it bears long legs, an elongated neck, and a long down-curved bill. White-faced ibis adults have dark maroon plumage with a white fringe around the eye and bill. All individuals have red eyes and a bare patch of skin between their eyes and their beak. White-faced ibis are summer residents in parts of Southern California and the Central Valley. They inhabit various wetlands throughout their range, preferring areas with emergent vegetation. This species uses its long bill to root out invertebrates buried in the mud and skim prey from the surface of the water. Females build their nests in tall wetland vegetation in areas in close proximity to shallow wading and feeding areas. Breeding takes place from May through July, with three to five eggs incubated for a period of 21 days. The young fledge after about five weeks. Lewis's woodpecker is a medium to large size and distinctively colored woodpecker species. Adult plumage consists of a dark green back, pink belly, gray collar, and dark red face. Lewis's woodpecker can be found in many woodland habitats throughout California but this species prefers areas with large stands of dead trees for roosting and nesting. Unlike most woodpeckers, this species will forgo foraging for wood-boring insects through the summer months and instead prey on insects midair, much like a flycatcher would. Adults will store air acorns and other seeds in tree crevices for use during the winter months. Breeding occurs from early May through July. Females either excavate a nest from a tree hollow or snag, or they may use a previously excavated nest. Clutch size ranges from four to nine eggs with an incubation period of two weeks. Nestlings fledge after about four to five weeks. Nuttall's woodpecker is a small woodpecker species measuring six to seven inches in length. Adults bear two narrow white stripes across their face with the rest of their bodies covered in various patterns of black and white stripes. Males display a red patch on the back of their heads. This species can be distinguished from similar co-occurring species by the thin horizontal black and white bars that run from the midsection of the back to just below the neck. Nuttall's woodpecker can be found throughout the riparian oak habitat of, of California. It feeds on tree sap, wood-boring insects, and other invertebrates that it can glean from twigs or leaves. Mates of this species form long-term pair bonds with breeding taking place from March through early July. Nests are excavated within snags in riparian habitat with a clutch size of four to six eggs. The male builds a new nest each year and also provides most of the incubation and brood tending for the developing young. Lawrence's goldfinch is a small passerine bird measuring four to five inches in length. Adults have yellow chest patches and yellow wing bars with gray backs and sides. Males of this species have black faces and more pronounced yellow patterning, while females have gray masks and more subdued coloration. This species is found within the deserts of Southern California, north to the foothills of the Santa Clara County and the Central Valley. This species is erratic and unpredictable in its seasonal breeding sites, but generally prefers riparian areas of foothill hardwood or desert vegetation. Breeding begins in late March with individuals forming monogamous pairs and rearing a clutch of three to six eggs. Nests are located in a tree or shrub with dense foliage 
and near a body of water. Incubation lasts for 12 to 13 days, with chicks leaving the nest after 11 days. The Valley Elderberry Longhorn Beetle is a one inch long dark beetle with green markings. The body is black with red wing coverings, while the forewings are dark metallic green with a bright reddish orange border. The shell has numerous puncture marks or indentations. The body is elongated and usually cylindrical. Color and strong association with the elderberry shrub distinguish this beetle from similar species. This species is completely dependent on the elderberry plant for food and shelter. It feeds on the stems and leaves of the plant at elevations from sea level to 2300 feet. Emergence coincides with bloom period of the elderberry plants. Valley elderberry longhorn beetle is known to occur in a very limited distribution from southern Shasta County to Kern County. When listed in 1980, the beetle was known from less than 10 locations along the American River, Huda Creek, and Merced River. Today, they have been documented in approximately 190 locations, based mostly on the exit holes from emerging beetles. These beetles and their elderberry shrub hosts must be protected on the project site with the following measures. Unless an elderberry shrub has been approved for removal, they will need to be avoided and fenced off from construction activities. Also, to prevent destruction of elderberry shrubs, only use established roadways for on-site travel. And finally, no insecticides or herbicides may be used for any activity within the project footprint. This section applies to all of the bird species that has been previously covered and any other species covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act or California Department of Fish and Wildlife Fish and Game Code 3503. A variety of bird species have been found nesting in or immediately adjacent to Caltrans right-of-ways. Nest sites are often placed in crevices, cavities, seams, or weep holes within bridges. Other nests are constructed on open vertical cement surfaces on bridges. The species that utilize man-made structures as nest sites tend to be more tolerant of urban conditions. These conditions might be increased noise, light, vibration, or simply human presence. But they can nonetheless be sufficiently disturbed during construction or maintenance activities enough to cause nest abandonment or inattentiveness which would result in the death or loss of eggs or juveniles. Incubation and brood rearing require approximately four to five weeks for smaller birds, but can take up to 12 weeks for larger raptors. And this is why it's incredibly important that we get nest deterrence up on the project site and prevent nesting as soon and as often as possible. Nesting birds will require their own protective measures. To start, most inactive nests on the project may be removed by the qualified biologist in order to prevent reoccupancy during the breeding season. And to the extent feasible, construction should take place outside of the nesting season, which is generally between February 1st and September 14th. If construction ceases for a period of time more than five days during the breeding season, the qualified biologist will be required to resurvey the construction area before construction can recommence. Northwestern pond turtle is a medium-sized turtle. The color ranges anywhere between brown to olive brown to blackish, and the shell is going to be anywhere between three and a half to eight and a half inches long. The species can be identified from the lines and spots that radiate from the center of the scutes, and the scutes are the bony plates that make up the shell of this animal. Males of this species tend to have a light throat and no markings, and a relatively flat shell, and females are going to have dark markings around their throat and have a noticeably taller shell. The species typically inhabits ponds and creeks and hibernates underwater for several months during the winter. Western pond turtles reach breeding age at about 8 to 10 years of age. Uh, breeding usually takes place in April and May. And what females will do is they'll climb onto land on the water margin and dig a nest. They'll lay a clutch of around 2 to 11 eggs, and those eggs will gestate for about 80 to 100 days before they'll hatch. Western pond turtles require special protective measures on this project. If you encounter a western pond turtle, it may be relocated by the qualified biologist to an area outside of the project. 
As a general rule, minimize vegetation disturbance, particularly in areas adjacent to water bodies. Much like the nesting birds, if construction ceases for a period of two weeks or greater, the qualified biologist will need to resurvey the project for this species before construction can resume. Sanford's arrowhead is a species of flowering plant in the water plantain family and is endemic to California's north coast and central valley. The plant is aquatic and grows up to 130 centimeters tall. The leaves are very often submerged, variable in shape, usually long and strap-shaped or narrowly lanceolate. Leaves may grow up to 25 centimeters long from the underwater stem. The flower is up to 3.5 centimeters wide with white petals. Sanford's arrowhead has been extirpated from Southern California and mostly extirpated from the Central Valley due to grazing, development, recreational activities, non-native plants, road widening, and channel alteration and maintenance. If Sanford's arrowhead is discovered in the project area, it will require fencing and regular monitoring to ensure that construction activities are not impacting plant health. Now we'll go over some of the additional key species protection measures for this project. These slides won't comprise an exhaustive list of necessary protective measures, but they should provide you with a good idea of what's expected. Please refer to your training booklet for a comprehensive list of species protection measures. So if a listed or regulated species shows up on or near the project site, we'll need to set up a protective radius for it. The radius is a no-work buffer that needs to remain in place until the animal leaves the area. For this project, all regulated species carry a radius of 100 feet, with the exception of the San Joaquin kit box and many of the bird species mentioned in the previous section. There are several general protective measures that need to be followed on this project. I'll go over these quickly, but you should review these measures in your training materials. First of all, all wildlife should be allowed to leave the job site unharmed. This includes any animals that don't carry state or federal protections. To prevent wildlife entrapment on the project, all excavations, and this includes trenches, holes, and pits, need to be covered at the end of each workday. If covering an excavation is not practical, earthen or wooden escape ramps need to be installed. Additionally, all litter, construction debris, and food-related waste generated on the site needs to be contained in sealed trash containers and removed from the construction area daily. Containing food waste is especially important, as these items tend to attract wildlife, which could ultimately cause project delays. During construction operations, stockpiling of construction materials, portable equipment, vehicles, and supplies needs to be restricted to the designated construction staging areas. The same goes for access roads into and out of the work area. Finally, restrict the disturbance of vegetation outside the work area to the minimum extent possible. Equipment cleaning is a consideration for environmental protection, mainly because this activity has the potential to wash harmful materials into the soil and surrounding water bodies. I'll try to go through these as quickly as possible. First off, all construction vehicles and waders must be cleaned before they can enter the project site. Any equipment that leaves the job site needs to be recleaned before it can enter again. Any cleaning that takes place in the project area should be limited to the minimum extent feasible. If you plan on cleaning equipment on site with solvents, steam, or soap, the engineer needs to be made aware. And all wash wastes need to be contained and disposed of properly. All vehicles need to be washed in a structure equipped with disposal facilities. You may wash vehicles in an outside area if that area is paved with concrete or asphalt, surrounded by a containment berm, and equipped with a sump. Hoses should be equipped with a positive shutoff valve, and vehicles should be washed with the minimum amount of water that's practical. All vehicles need to be pressure washed upon exiting and entering the project site using the specifications outlined here. Additionally, any equipment such as boots or waders that has entered the bo a body of water should be thoroughly scrubbed with a stiff bristled brush to prevent the spread of organisms. It must then be either submerged in a hot water bath, frozen, or left to dry for at least 48 hours. 
All cleaning activities on the project site need to be conducted over drip pans or containment mats with the resulting wastewater disposed of at the appropriate wastewater facility. There are only a handful of erosion control measures for this project. BMPs need to be in place anywhere soil can run off into jurisdictional waters. They should be monitored before and after storms and placed in such a way that they do not entangle or obstruct escape routes for regulated species. Straw bales, straw wattle, or similar means are acceptable BMP methods, but plastic netting is prohibited. We've touched on toxic materials in the equipment washing section, but there are a few more requirements that need to be met. All construction materials need to be removed from the site and disposed of properly at the end of the project. There should be absolutely no discharge of hazardous materials into water bodies or the soil. These materials may not be left in areas that are exposed to heavy storm flow. And finally, absorbent materials need to be on site at all times to provide immediate cleanup relief if a spill occurs. In order to prevent the spread of invasive species to and from the project site, the following protection measures need to be implemented. This is the final slide of our protection measure section. At least two business days prior to using vehicles and equipment on the project site, a signed statement needs to be submitted that states the equipment has been properly cleaned of debris that may spread invasives. Equipment should be cleaned away from sensitive habitat and waterways. We'll finish up here with some important takeaways from this presentation. Perhaps the most important takeaway is remembering what your responsibilities are if you see a regulated species within the project site. Don't touch or approach regulated wildlife and immediately report encounters to your supervisor or the on-site biologist. Keep your training materials somewhere where you can readily access them. If an animal wanders onto the construction site and you're unsure whether it's a cause for concern, your booklets contain the necessary contact information and procedures to follow in order to protect yourself and your company. It is important to remember that you and your company are wholly responsible for following the measures in this training video and its associated training materials, as well as the permits and specifications for this project. So please revisit this video and your training materials as needed. This concludes the Biological Resources Information Program training video. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions about what's been covered in this presentation or your training materials, please direct them to your on-site alluvian biologist.